And with that, I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Ephraim Cloisters Museum educator, Michael Showalter. I hope you enjoy his presentation, A Brethren Who Have Their Own Farms, The Householders at Ephrata. Now, if you just get us a minute, we'll get this transitioned over to Michael. Michael, are you ready? I think I'm ready. Okay, it's all yours. All right. Well, Conrad Beisel, Ephrata's founder, told a visitor in 1753, quote, those of our brethren who have their own farms around us are of the same mind, although they do not live in the same way. This uh, bit of information uh, presented by Beisel just added one more puzzling layer to the story of the Ephrata community this visitor had just encountered. And even two and a half centuries later, the presence of Ephrata's married congregation presents some questions. At the same time, the descendants of these early families remain a living legacy of this national historic landmark. So today, I want to share with you a very brief look at the historic effort of Cloister and the married members who played a vital role in this community in its early years. While the married congregation had a longer presence at the historic site than did the celibate community, the story of the householders does not figure largely in history books. I'll touch on my own theories about this a little later on, but uh, maybe you'll pick up on it as we go. I've packed an awful lot of information in today's program, probably more than should be squeezed into the short time we have together. So please take advantage of that chat box with your questions. And if we don't get to your questions at the end of the program, I'll try and get back to you with a specific answer. I'm hoping that uh, folks are familiar with Ephra's history, but if you want to know a little bit more about the full and long complex history of Ephra, you might look for some books in libraries or used book sites. Unfortunately, many of the best sources are no longer in print. I'm showing you three items here. The one on the left is a guidebook, a very general history, and that was published in 2000. In the center is a 1963 book, Effort as Seen by Contemporaries. And while that might sound a little old, but it's one of the best of the histories surviving. And then if you want to know more about Conrad Beisel, Effort as founder and his thinking and how that reflected in daily life in the community, the book on the far right by Jeff Bach, Voices of the Turtle Doves, is still available. And you can find copies of that in the museum store at the Effort of Cloister. Our website will help you connect with that. Today we're going to focus on that part of the Ephrata community that, as I said, doesn't receive as much attention. I, one theory I have about that is the fact that the story of married folks at Ephrata really isn't quite as, uh, shall we say, unique uh, or a novel as that of the celibate community who once lived in the Ephrata settlement. I'm hoping everyone is familiar with the basic story of historic Ephrata Cloister. It was founded in 1732 by Conrad Beisel, a German immigrant with a very unique perspective on life and ways of worshiping. He had been the leader of a Church of the Brethren congregation here in Lancaster County, but he left that church in 1728 to follow his own ideas. He taught his followers that God was coming very soon and earthly life should be spent preparing to meet God. Part of that required the giving up of daily activities and life that was worldly in his view. That included uh, the sacrifice of marriage. He encouraged celibacy. He also taught his followers to worship on Saturday, the seventh day of the week. For those who chose the celibate lifestyle in the community, they went a little bit even further following a very monastic lifestyle. They wore a white robe. They had only a few little, move, little food during the day and it was mostly a vegetarian diet. And their sleep was uh, divided into six periods of time with a midnight worship service each night. To always be ready, ready to meet God, they also slept on a wooden bench and used a block of wood for a pillow. I think you can see the novelty of Ephrata. The brothers and sisters at Ephrata achieved some amazing accomplishments. They created these impressive Germanic-style buildings by the 1740s. 
They produced some of the nation's earliest folk art known as Fraktur or Pennsylvania German illuminated manuscripts. They also wrote over a thousand original pieces of music, including the first female composers in America. They had a printing press and they published the largest book created in the colonies before the Revolutionary War. That was life for the celibate members. But we need to do a little bit of terminology before we go too much further. Today's effort at Cloister did not have a formal name in the 18th century. Neighbors and visitors called the residents of Ephrata Beislingers, Seventh Dayers, and occasionally Dunkers, although that, that term really fits to the Church of the Brethren that Beisel had left earlier. It was these outside observers who applied the term cloister to the settlement because they saw the monastic lifestyle of the celibates and they equated it with the Roman Catholic convents and monasteries of the old world. Members at Ephrata never used the term cloister to describe themselves or, the, or their home. This was a Protestant settlement and unlike a secluded cloister cut off from society, the doors of Ephrata were never closed to visitors and members were permitted to go out and explore the world. I tend to use the words Ephrata, Ephrata community, and Ephrata congregation, or settlement, all to describe this 18th century community. Now the term householder, well, it very infrequently appears in the 18th century records. The community's self-published history, the Chronicon Ephratensa, uses uh, words like house fathers, house mothers. Most often it just refers to the unmarried or the married families as the congregation. I use those words, congregation, families, and house fathers and mothers, but you'll hear me use householders as well. Also have to give you a little disclaimer about what you're going to see today. Uh, it's rather difficult to do an illustrated talk about the effort of community when the vast amount of resources in our library reflect the celibate community. We know of no images of 18th century residents of Ephrata, either celibate or married members. A few images from the early 19th century survive, but it's really only in the last quarter of the 1800s that photography begins to show us the faces of the remaining married folks living at Ephrata at that time. I've chosen images today from European sources, but I don't want you to mistake the art you see as coming from Ephrata. There are some photographs of the historic site and photographs of the artwork created at Ephrata, but those are scarce amongst all of the images you'll see. Now, with all of that as a background, let's get to the heart of the story. Even before Conrad Beisel created the cloister settlement in 1732, he had been serving as a leader of a congregation. And by those early years, many of his congregation followers had already chosen to adopt his ideas about Saturday worship. And when he moved to Ephrata's spot in 1732, many of those early families followed him, taking up land around the community. I'm showing you an early map of Ephrata, and the green spot right in the middle is the 250 acres of land on which the celibate community lived and worked. The blue spots all around are just a small selection of the married members who took up land in the neighborhood. There were others, I just didn't get them all squeezed into this map. So who were these married people? Well, as a whole, Ephrata was not really good about keeping detailed records. One source of information appears in this, the history of the Chronicon Ephratensa. It was published by the brothers in 1786. Another information source for us are three lists recording deaths of people associated with Ephrata. But among these three lists, no one seems complete. It's also possible that some of the names on the list are not even members, but just acquaintances of the congregation. There are people buried in the God's Acre Cemetery at the historic site who were never members of Ephrata. The first semi-official list of names appears in 1770, two years after Beisel's death. 
Morgan Edwards was a Bap an English Baptist minister. He attempted to write a short history of every Baptist congregation in the colonies, and he provided lists of members. Now, his list is probably also incomplete, but he identifies 91 people he calls, quote, married members and their offspring, although he clearly has not included all the children. Is this because they were not yet baptized members? Had they already left Ephrata? We don't fully understand the source for his list. He also attempts to anglicize some of the Germanic names, which occasionally leads to a little bit of confusion. Using these sources and others, the staff has assembled a database of householders for the 18th, 19th, and early 20th centuries, but it too may be incomplete. We call this database the people file, and I'm showing you on the left here one of the master index pages, and on the right a printout of entries for Daniel Faunastock at the top and his father Dietrich at the bottom. This is at present the best material we have to begin our research, and you'll see Daniel's uh, Fauna Stock's entry at the top is rather small, and that's actually pretty typical of most of the database entries in this uh, large file. Dietrich Fauna Stock's entry, which begins at the bottom of this page, actually does go on for about 10 more pages, but they're not all that detailed. At this point, I need to offer just a few words about research, research resources available at the historic site. And the Ephrata Cloister holds a very small library, and family history material is a very little part of that material at the site. The books shown in this 18th century print probably outnumber the size of our library by fourfold. Very few materials we have extend beyond the 18th and early 19th century. So if you're interested in some basic introductory material, we can probably help you with a few facts about the first generation, maybe a little bit on the second generation. But if you've done any family history, you know each generation multiplies in the amount of records to keep track of. And with more than two or dozen families to monitor, it gets a little out of hand for our small staff. If you're doing research on your family, I encourage you to use as many resources as you can locate, including other historical societies and libraries and online sources, but use those with caution. I also encourage you to keep in mind that now familiar pro Russian proverb, trust but verify. You'll see what I mean by this when we get to a little bit later in our story. Married members and their children came to Ephrata as families to join the community. They had left their former congregations, including Mennonite, Brethren, German Reformed, and Lutheran, to follow Beisel in his teachings. Rarely did celibate members marry or, and become married members of the congregation. In fact, on the other way around, sometimes families come to Ephrata and a few of the family members will join the celibate community. Such was the case for the daughter of Magdalena and Peter Klopp, whose daughter we only know by her spiritual name she followed within the community as Sister Tekla. The Klopps had three other daughters who married and remained affiliated with the congregation, but they had three other daughters and a son who did not remain with Ephrata. While several of the celibate sisters and brothers married neighbors, not of the congregation, these former celibates left their affiliation with Ephrata. In many ways, the life of Ephrata's married members closely resembled those of their neighbors who attended those Lutheran and German Reformed and Mennonite churches in the area. While the white robes of the celibates set them apart from the world, householders had no apparent restrictions on their dress, with one brief exception during the late 1730s. At that time, married members were required to wear a gray habit when they came to the settlement. This showed their membership as part of the effort of married congregation, but it still set them apart from those who followed the celibate calling. Their dress likely reflected the pietist ideas of modesty and conservative living of many of their uh, conservative neighbors. For women and girls, everything began with a shift, a combination undergarment and nightgown. Atop this went a petticoat or what we might call a skirt and a short gown. 
An apron, a neck handkerchief, and a cap completed the attire. In her 1779 will, married member Anna Landis left a brown wool petticoat and a blue wool petticoat to celibate sister Martha. Perhaps under those white robes, the sisters wore additional layers of comfort and uh, didn't matter what the color was. For men in boys' clothing, it included long stockings and knee breeches, white linen shirts, vests, coats, and hats. The 1771 estate inventory of married member Frederick Keller included a hat, a brown coat, a white coat, two vests, and a pair of leather breeches. One thing that did set the men of Ephrata and conservative men in the neighborhood apart from their neighbors was that of a beard, a very distinguishing style not found in most of 18th century society. One 18th century visitor to the site referred to the men of Ephrata as, quote, hairy sylvans, or in other words, hairy men of the woods. At the same time when the gray habit was required of family members visiting his site, a bell was rung to announce the midnight worship service. It said that it could be heard for four miles around the settlement. The community history says that families awoke at the sound of the midnight bell and held devotional time in their own homes. Like the gray habit, this too may have only lasted for a short period of time. There was a, a very active membership among the married folks, even after the celibates, or after they were wearing the robes and getting up at midnight. Some married members hosted the Christian fellowship meal love feast within their own home. Yes. And music was always a big part of fellowship within the community. Conrad Beisel developed his own system for creating a cappella hymns and chorales, and he taught other members to compose and write the musical texts. Some married members, uh, uh, at least 15 of the married members, wrote musical texts which were published within the community's hymnals. Now, those included people such as uh, Rosanna Schenk and uh, Ludwig Benter. Michael Miller, one of the other married members, paid for the publication of two religious devotional books, and his name appears on the cover of those books. As some of the married members may have also played, paid close attention to Beisel's call to abstain from sexual relations. This certainly seems to be the case for Katerina Beeler, whose neglected husband had an affair with a neighboring widow for which action he was removed from the congregation. Katerina ended her days living with the sisters. During the early 1740s, records show a dramatic drop in births among Ephrata's family members, with only four children born to married members between 1740 and 1746. The community's history reports that many married couples refrained from relations prior to the dramatic episode which involved the families and the building of a structure known as Hebron. The Chronica Nefertens suggests the entire episode occurred at the instigation of Israel and Samuel Eckerlin, the leading brothers who developed the community's industries. At the same time, Beisel must have endorsed the project and used his influence to set matters in motion. Already in 1741, Beisel required that the householders construct their own meeting house at the site, and I'm showing you that surviving building built in 1741. But two years later, in 1743, the married folks built a new dormitory attached to the meeting house. This structure had a separate entrance for men and a separate for women, and there was a wall down the center of each floor dividing each level for men and women's sides. Married couples were convinced to separate and pursue celibate lives in these structures. Before moving in, the wives insisted on a written letter of divorce to show they were no longer under their husband's control. And the children were left back on the farms under the care of older siblings and neighbors. Married members, uh, John Senselman was put in charge of the actions of the uh, people living in the house and he maintained daily activity. Once entering this Hebron structure, the married folks were supposed to surrender their farmland. After about 18 months, it became quite apparent this test of spiritual devotion would not succeed. Mothers missed their children, and it appears few people surrendered any property. 
The community also faced a threatened lawsuit for issuing divorces contrary to the laws of the country. With Beisel's permission, the couple ceremoniously burned the divorce letters, reunited, and returned to their farms. Couples who participated in the venture received repayment of losses as much as possible, including 100 acres of land granted to Heinrich Miller for his trouble. After remodeling Hebron, the sisters occupied the building, renaming it Saren or Saren or Sharon, and the sisterhood became known as the Roses of Sharon. Today, the building stands as one of the great central features of the historic site. But even while the celibate members were still living in Hebron, this house also became a refuge for people in need, including widows and widowers, assistance that continued throughout the history of the community. As immigrants, many of the couples had little other family in America to care for them in their old age, and Ephrata opens, it to, opens its doors for their support. Widow Christina Hearn came to live at Ephrata after the death of her husband Heinrich in 1744. She remained there for the remaining 25 years of her life. In 1751, Jakob and uh, Maria Barbara Kimmel came to Ephrata from Germany. They had spent the winter at Ephrata, but the following spring moved 50 miles to the west, to York County. It was there in York County where Maria Barbara died two years later, and Jakob returned to live among the brothers for the remaining 30 years of his life. I have to add a little side note about this image you're seeing. The painting was done in 1882, and it's we are pretty certain that it was painted inside a building at Historic Ephrata Cloister. On the far left edge at the bottom, you'll see just a peak of a little bit of a chest sitting there. Behind the woman uh, over her shoulder is a red shelf unit uh, peeking out from that blue cupboard at her knee or curtain at her knees. It's a bit of an iron stove. And in the upper right hand corner, a hanging cupboard. We believe these are all objects which still survive in the historic collection at the site, but the building itself probably no longer survives. Aside from the brief period when some married members attempted the celibate lifestyle in Hebron, the homes of householders resembled those of their neighbors. Most of these were one or two story log buildings, a style of structure that remained dominant in the area until the early 1800s. This 19th century photograph shows the home of householder Boris Faunastock and later married member Elias Binkley. While covered with stucco and filled with uh, later style windows, this building still stands about a block from the historic site and it is a one and a half story log structure that could date to the 18th century. It's uh, very representative of the kind of building that the married folks were living in in their earliest days in Ephrata. About a block to the east of the historic site, a portion of the house occupied by married members Abraham and Susanna Konigmacher also contains a style of structure found at the community. It's a half timber building with the walls built of a wooden frame and the spaces in the frame filled with stone and mud. This type of construction is found in that large meeting house I showed you and several other smaller buildings at the historic site. Inside these homes, whitewashed walls and bare wooden floors greeted guests who sat among typical Pennsylvania German furniture. The kucha or the kitchen likely contained a cupboard holding pewter, imported European ceramics, and locally made red earthenware dishes. The great hearth located in the center of the house provided ample space for cooking on the iron, brass, and copper kettles and pots. A table provided the workspace for meal preparation but not serving meals. While the celibate members of the community had a rather meager diet compared to most, such restrictions did not apply to the married congregation. And uh, the, uh, the luxuries such as sugar and coffee appear within estate inventories of married members. But again, these items probably only appeared sporadically since they were expensive imported objects. Like other neighbors, householder tables held meat from their animals they raised, vegetables from their gardens, and bread from their own grain. 
beef and veal specifically appear in estate inventories, and for Pennsylvania Germans, the popular pork appeared in every form, including bacon. A wheat, rye, and corn appear in several inventories, and the mill operated by the brothers provided a convenient place to grind this grain into flour. And now, I mentioned the, uh, one of the questions that comes up from visitors, and that is the use of alcohol within the community. We have no good answers to that question for the celibate members, but we know alcohol was consumed by married members. This was no reflection on the quality of the water as there were many freshwater springs in the area included, including at the community site. Instead, this is a product of the European culture brought to, your, um, your, uh, to America, and just as the drinking of tea, which married members also enjoyed. Another per per pervasive element of 18th century life was the use of tobacco, but we can find no evidence of tobacco use among effort as men members. I mentioned that table in the kitchen for preparing food, but the food was consumed in the neighboring room, the Stuba. It was there that families gathered for an early breakfast, dinner, which was the largest meal of the day, served at midday, and supper in the evening. The Stuba or the stove room contained an iron stove. This was placed against the wall shared by the back of the kitchen hearth and it provided heat for the house and made these homes very different than their English neighbors because these German stoves permitted the comfort of the space to be used in the winter time for all sorts of life and work. Married member Dietrich Faunestock reports installing two stoves in, in his home he built in 1751. He also talks about using the brother's sawmill to cut the timber for the construction of his home. This stuba or stove room would serve as the center of family activity, meals, work, socializing, even sleeping for some of the householder members. Adjacent to the stove room was likely to be the bedroom for the parents, while children found space for sleeping upstairs. It was only after the family had established a comfortable life in what seems a rather humble log structure that the fine stone houses dotting the landscape began to appear. Although greatly altered, the home built by Dietrich and Marguerite Fonestock in 1751, I'm showing you here, still stands about a mile and a half from the community. And only a few blocks away from the site is the 1795 house built by Jacob Kimmel Jr. and his wife Esther. These are a, only a few of the surviving married members' homes in the neighborhood. The owner of this house, Jacob Kimmel Jr., also presents one of Ephrata's most puzzling questions. In, 16, in 1763, the brothers printed this abolition pamphlet, maybe at the request of the Society of Friends or Quakers. The book had been authored by a Quaker and published in English in Philadelphia the year before. Despite this, press, this book coming off the press of the brothers in the 1760s, the tax records in 1787, 88, and 89 document that Jacob Kimmel uh, was holding an enslaved woman. Nothing is known about her, not even her name. What does her presence at Ephrata reveal about Ephrata's attitudes towards slavery? Clearly, this shows that like all of the Ephrata congregation and settlement, the community existed as part of a larger world. As people of the world, they also became involved as citizens in the new land. This required all men and boys over the age of 16 to take an oath of allegiance to the English crown when they arrived as immigrants. In the 1750s and 60s, some of the married members took this step further by becoming full naturalized citizens of the colony. But in 1777, things became difficult when the Revolutionary War government of Pennsylvania asked residents to take a new oath of allegiance to the new Pennsylvania state government. This became a struggle for many conservative immigrants. They had already been asked to deny the allegiance to the country of their birth. Now they were asked to forsake the government in the country where they lived for an yet untested new system. 
many of Effort as Anabaptist neighbors said their loyalty was to God only, not an earthly ruler. Some married members complied by taking the new oath, but married member Dietrich Fonestock Jr. refused and seems to have caused a bit of stir when he avoided capture for refusal to take the oath. The Revolutionary War also called men to serve as soldiers, contrary to their conscience, Effort as married members were eligible for service, but many appealed their call to duty and paid a fine instead. And here's where that warning about careful family research comes into play. By the grave of married member Jacob Gorgas in the cemetery at the cloister, the Daughters of the American Revolution have placed a marker commemorating his service. However, he never served. Misinformation led to the placement of the plaque, for on the day that Gorgas reported for duty, he came with a paper in hand that, quote, provided a certificate from two surgeons of the Continental Army that he was not fit for military duty. Instead, Gorgas paid a fine of six pounds, seven shillings, and six pence. I really like that this plaque is with us because it really serves as a great teaching tool to talk about the importance of research and good thorough research. When Beisel came to effort in 1732, he sought to escape all those worldly things such as governments and wars. He arrived at effort alone, renouncing material goods. But within two years of his arrival, nearly 30 celibate members had followed him. This rapid increase in population of ascetic celibates required the support provided by families. The community history reports the married members, quote, daily offerings were the main sustenance, end quote, of the brothers and sisters. The account book of married member Michael Miller provides evidence of the economic relationship between the celibate and married members. Miller, a window maker, tinsmith, carpenter, weaver, and blacksmith, paid the sisters with butter to spin wool into yarn. He also repaired spinning wheels and lanterns for the sisters. In 1762, he made 13 windows for the sisters' house, for which he received five pounds, 13 shillings from Maria Eicher, the leader of the sisterhood. The next year, Miller loaned Maria Eicher 10 pounds sterling that she seems to have used to purchase land in her own name. Support for the celibates came in different forms. Certainly, the married folks joined the brothers in constructing the large buildings in the community. Most families engaged in farming and householders donated crops from their fields and orchards. Several of the married members also engaged in trades, producing items that assisted the celibates in their daily life. Among the married members who likely contributed objects to the celibates, we had Christian Bollinger, who was a weaver, Christian Bauman, a papermaker, Adam Konigmacher, a stocking weaver, Jacob Gorgas, a clockmaker, Jacob Nagley, a carpenter, John Bauman, a miller, Samuel Zerfas, a shoemaker, William and Benjamin Konigmacher, tanners, Dietrich Fonestock Jr., a physician, John Bauman, a printer, Jacob Kimmel, an innkeeper, Adam Konigmacher, a storekeeper, Jacob Sensiman, a blacksmith, Heinrich Miller, a stonemason, and finally Daniel Good, a potter. So you see, this truly was a wide ranging community. But what about the women of the married congregation? Like many of the women of the 18th and early 19th century, they left very few written records or products of their work to document their lives. Evidence suggests that Christina Konigmacher continued to operate the store run by her husband, Adam, after his death in 1793. I think we can safely assume that the married women handled the domestic duties as their culture dictated, caring for the family cow and turning their milk into butter for sale, preparing the family meals, including tending the herb gardens and vegetable gardens and preserving food for winter. Textile work included helping to harvest flax and spinning it into linen thread, spinning wool yarn and knitting the yarn into things such as stockings and mittens for the families. Mothers served as the family doctor. They also were farm labor, especially during harvest. Michael Miller records paying local women for helping with harvest, and he paid other women for spinning wool into yarn. 
on average, householder families had about six or seven children. At the community, Brother Obed conducted a school for the children, even publishing his own school book in 1786, which I'm showing you here. Literacy rates were high among all Pennsylvania Germans. It was important to have the skills to read and understand the scriptures, communicate with family and friends in other parts of the world with letters, and maintain household and farm accounts. Providing mills for farm products and schooling for children was not the only support extended by the celibate community to the married members. Some evidence suggests families who came to effort are looking to join the community may have also spent a brief period living in the buildings at the historic site before establishing their own homes in the area. Clearly, this was the case for several families who arrived from Gimsheim, Germany in the fall of 1751, including the Lohmann, the Heinrich, and the Kimmel families, all of whom established themselves in York County the following spring. The relationship between the married and the celibate members was not without difficulties. When in the early 1740s, the uh, administrative leader, Israel Eckerlin, the one who may have instituted Hebron, uh, he took the family donations and stockpiled them until the supplies in the neighborhood were short, then sold the donations at a profit. The married folks objected and stopped making donations. This led Eckerlin to develop the mills operated by the brothers. Tensions between the groups eased after Eckerlin left Ephrata in 1745. And two years after he left, in, there was a fire that severely damaged the brothers' grain mill. Married folks quickly helped to restore the operation, for which Beisel declared the married members should receive half of the mill's profits. Instead, the married folks released their share of the money to the sisterhood. Conrad Beisel appears to have maintained the balance of support and fellowship between the married and celibate groups in the community. His charisma brought everyone to effort and he used his allure to manage his followers. He lived among the brothers and sisters and they clearly saw him as their daily guide, but family members not in his general presence were not hesitant to turn to Beisel when in need of guidance. Such was the case with a generational conflict when it developed in the congregation in 1749. And young people have always reached a stage of rebellion, and, and in this case, their parents turned to Conrad Beisel as their spiritual advisor for help. Historic records do not clearly identify the nature of the difficulties, but Beisel's response gives us some clues. He declared that May 15th, 1749 should be a day of fasting and prayer, and on that day, parents were to collect the, quote, worldly clothing, end quote, uh, adopted by the children and burn the garments. What made the clothing worldly? Was it the color? Was it the trim? Did it not exhibit the acceptable level of modesty? Whatever the objection, it went against the sense of conservative ideals espoused by the members of the congregation. The idea of parents objecting to children's sense of fashion is nothing new, but uh, Beisel also said that in exchange for the loss of clothing, children would from that point forward have the liberty to marry as they chose. Here then may be the first signs of a crack in the system of Ephrata that would contribute to the eventual decline. Intermarriage between householder families has left a tangled web of genealogies within this community. Jacob Sensiman and Margaret Klopp were, great, were a great example of this group of children who married and remained within the congregation. Both Jacob and Margaret were children of devoted householder families, and they made history in the community by being the first couple married by Beisel in 1749. One critic said Beisel agreed to the marriage rather than lose the families among his flock. But in 1772, their daughter, Rachel Sensiman, made another type of news in the community by marrying John Palmer, a man not raised in the cloister faith. Their wedding occurred at the First German Reformed Church in Lancaster in 1772, and four years later, Rachel formally joined the German Reformed Church, receiving baptism into the congregation near Ephrata. 
Rachel Sensiman Balmer was not the only one marrying outside the faith. But in the case of Barbara Widener, things turned out a bit differently. Her husband, Christian Rohrbach, did not join the effort of congregation, but Barbara did not leave her affiliation with the church. That 1770 list of members I mentioned very early on lists Barbara, but not Christian, as a member, suggesting a religiously divided household. While the turmoil of 1749 led to a burning of clothing and a loosening of marital choices, it was not until Conrad Beisel's death in 1768 that the greatness of Ephrata began to fade. While still alive, Beisel held sway among the married members, most of whom appeared to have been faithful followers. That religious devotion did not carry on to the younger generations, especially after the loss of the congregation's charismatic leader. With Conrad Beisel's death, the Ephrata community began to lose the spiritual passion that had forged the settlement. About three dozen celibate members remained, struggling to maintain the lifestyle they had followed during the previous three decades, but at the same time adapting to a new set of conditions. With the vigor of their youth starting to fade, soft beds began to replace benches and wooden block pillows, meat began to enter the celibate's diet, and the midnight worship service ceased to continue. Married folks now took on a larger supporting role, helping the aging celibates. It's likely the married folks were responsible for adding the stone kitchen addition to the rear of the meeting house just after Beisel's death. Times had changed and the motivation for a monastic community faded as younger generations saw the promise of Western lands and wider social networks. With the death of the last celibate members in 1813, the buildings in the faith fell to the married congregation. The remaining families came together the following year to form the German Seventh-day Baptist Church at Ephrata. The number of family members was small even at the start in 1814, and their number continued to decrease over time. Over the next century and a quarter, members would inhabit the old buildings, rent out others, farm the land, and struggle to maintain their church. By the 1930s, only 11 members remained, most of one family who disagreed about the fate of the cloister. Four years of court proceedings ended in 1934 with the end of the church that had begun in 1814. This action allowed the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to gain control of the historic site, begin its restoration, and ensure its continued preservation. The story of the married members of Ephrata leaves two big questions. What did Conrad Be why, why did Conrad Beisel permit the existence of a married congregation when he encouraged celibacy as a requirement for entrance to heaven? And secondly, why did married members choose to affiliate with Ephrata? Only a few scattered clues address these points, so it remains for a bit of speculation to offer some suggestions. Beisel always remained focused on the spiritual matters at Ephrata. No copy of his 1729 publication on marriage appears to survive. A later document issued at Ephrata suggests some of his thoughts on marriage. This later 1743 account describes marriage as, quote, a disciplinary ordinance for fallen people, end quote. From this perspective, Beisel saw marriage as a testing ground for individuals, hoping they would discover the world's severity outside of God's full and focused love. He might suggest marriage would awaken within individuals the longing for a closer relationship with God, leading them to recognize the higher level of intimacy with God that was available in the celibate life. For Beisel, this mission to bring people closer to God became an ongoing challenge among the married members at Ephrata. He seems always to minister to the householders in separately from the celibates, counseling them to find ways to put their spiritual life ahead of their worldly concerns. The events surrounding the building of Hebron certainly stand as a clear example of putting faith before family. Perhaps Beisel also considered the children of the married congregation as, a prospective, as prospective celibate members, although few ever adopted the celibate life. And despite spiritual concerns, Beisel may have also had practical matters in mind when he welcomed the householders. 
Clearly, he knew of the congregational support offered to Roman Catholic convents and monasteries in Europe, not only monetary tithes, but goods such as crops and products from workshops supported those celibate institutions, and the same held true at Ephrata. Few business records survive for the effort of community, but the income from the grain and sawmill and the small production at the printing press could hardly support the 60 or so celibate members of the community, and uh, despite their conservative lifestyle. What portion of family support came to the cloister is not clear, but it certainly helped to fill the gap between the celibate's needs and their own efforts to support themselves. Such support leads to the question of why did families choose to be part of Ephrata? Householders' lives seem very little different from their neighbors. Compared to 18th century records for the area, most of Ephrata's families fell within what we'd call the middling sort or the middle class, with a few families doing better and a very few at the lower end of the economic scale. Without distinctive form of dress or language, Ephrata's married members mixed freely on the roads and in the markets with their neighbors, in short, what separated effort as married members from others in their time and place was their choice of faith and the day on which they celebrated those beliefs. So why did they choose this unusual effort of theology? Where the, there were benefits to ties with the celibate community, the mills, the educational opportunities for children, support following the loss of a spouse certainly provided a benefit to the married congregation. Yet these same advantages were available to any church membership, be it Lutheran, German Reformed, or Mennonite groups in the neighborhood. But what those congregations lacked was the dynamic, charismatic, and independent Conrad Beisel. He provided structure and leadership for a faith that held no allegiance to a European managed church hierarchy. Prior to the mid 1740s, many of the German Reformed and Lutheran congregations, who made up the greatest amount of German settlers in early Pennsylvania, shared houses of worship and shared itinerant ministers as they awaited ordained leadership to arrive. An early German immigrant compared the diversity of people and religions aboard his ship coming to Pennsylvania to that of Noah's Ark. And by the time many of these people had sorted themselves out and obtained good church management, Conrad Beisel had established a hold on Pennsylvania's frontier. A final question to ask about the married members and the celibate followers of Beisel relates to attitudes. Did one group look down on the other for their lifestyle they chose to follow? Again, documents are silent. This is my own personal theory and answer to the question, but I can offer no proof to support it. Having spent a long time in learning about the aspects of the community, this is how I would answer that question. Well, I think the celibates may have seen themselves just a bit closer to God because of their choice of celibacy, and married members must have recognized their lives as one of comfort and privilege compared to that of the brothers and sisters. I think both groups viewed each other with acceptance and respect. This was not to say there may not have been cliques and confrontations or jealousies, but these did not get in the way of creating a community. This same spirit of cooperation was exhibited among the great cultural diversity present in early Pennsylvania. Married member Dietrich Vonestock provides a core of this idea when he wrote to his brother in 1748 saying, Excuse me. Hang on. Uh oh. There we go. I moved to a place called Conestoga. We did not move because of lack or want of material things, as we had plenty to carry on this mortal life, in fact, a surplus of such things. But because God and our immortality, we looked for people who had the same desire to lead a blameless and God fearing life, which is very hard to find among the majority of people. As we found such people in the above place, we moved there, and in sympathy with them, it was easier to attain such a life. For as bad company can destroy good habits, so good company can destroy bad habits. And through encouragement and cooperation with one another, much good can be accomplished. This was the reason why we moved to the above-mentioned place, where we are now living on a property near to a place called Ephrata. 
an old adage tells us that we need to look to the past to learn how to live today and to prepare for the future. Dietrich Faunastock's search for good people to live among and cooperate with, and the larger story of effort as married members continues to speak to the ongoing struggle to achieve a better life for individuals and for the world. Today, the historic effort of Cloister stands as a national historic landmark, an exclusive distinction recognizing the community's achievements and contributions to America's history. Effort as early families shared in creating this rich heritage, helping to capture the story of America in a way unlike any other place in the nation. Thank you for allowing me to share some of this fascinating story with you this afternoon. Thank you, Michael. Now, um, if you have you have some time for some questions. Oh, absolutely. If we, um, if you have a question, please type it into the chat box. You can uh, make sure you type it to everybody, and I will uh, be reading those off and can ask Michael um, the questions. If anybody has any uh, information they would like to know or specific questions. Again, if you have a specific question about your family, the best bet is probably to email us at efforta1732 at gmail.com. Give everybody a few minutes here and see if anything right now. But do you feet. think the residents considered this settlement a utopian experiment? You know, that word utopian comes up very often, especially we get a lot of uh, college groups studying utopias. And I often think of utopia as looking for perfection. I don't think Beisel ever imagined there would be perfection on earth but he felt there would be perfection in heaven. So he struggled to get to heaven. But I think he recognized the difficulties in getting through earthly life before he could get, could get to that perfection. And Jenny Milko, Milkowski, sorry, Jenny, if I butchered that, <laughs> did some of the cloistered women, some of the cloistered include women, and were some married before and then cloistered became celibate after becoming widowed? They were, and there were a few cases of women who left their husbands. I mentioned Katerina Beeler, uh, who left her husband and, and took up with the celibate community, and then he had an affair with a neighboring widow. Um, the other really great example of that is Maria Christina Sauer. Uh, she left her husband and her 10-year-old son to live in Iceland, and the celibate sisters. She was among them for about 10 years until she was convinced to return to her husband. Okay. Uh, what about Conrad Weiser? <laughs> Weiser uh, joined the community in, seven, in May of 1735. And uh, at that point, there was a great uh, turmoil among all the Lutheran and German Reformed congregations in the neighborhood where he was living and in his own congregation. And Beisel took advantage of that turmoil and, and gathered a few members out of those other congregations, including Peter Miller, who became the Ephrata's second leader. But Weiser came to Ephrata as a result of that. I think Weiser was a deeply spiritual man, but I think he was also going through a bit of a spiritual crisis personally. He, in 1741, he was appointed a justice of the peace, and he also had been doing work for the colonial government of Pennsylvania, negotiating with Native Americans. By 1743, he left Effort in a, in a bit of a huff. Um, his resignation letter, uh, he's complaining about the creation of these big buildings. And he said, you wanted to live a simple life and yet you're building these grand palaces. Um, he, uh, he probably in the eight years he was a member was only on the site a total of about a year and a half because he was always out doing government work in the neighborhood. He also was visiting his wife because at least three of his children were born during that period as he was a supposedly a celibate brother. And then we have two questions here relating to the Church of the Brethren. 
Uh, how are relations with members of other faiths, such as the Church of the Brethren, and was there a connection to the Church of the Brethren? So Beisel had been the, the first uh, minister for the La first Lancaster County congregation of what's now the Church of the Brethren back in 1724. He left them in 1728. And in the 17, mid 1730s, actually Beisel was really competing among people for membership and was a little bit ahead of the Brethren in, in getting new members. Um, I will say that uh, the Brethren, my, my experience has been that earlier brethren historians always kind of viewed Beisel as a kind of an odd duck and, and really didn't want to acknowledge too much connection. But I think that attitude has dramatically changed in the past 20, 30 or so years. Um, and I really credit two great scholars, Dr. Donald Dernbaugh and Dr. Jeff Bach, with helping to change that approach. Where now I find the Brethren Church recognizes effort as a very significant, a unique, but a very significant part of their own history. And we love to have those brethren groups come to visit with us. Uh, we have another question here. I know there are records of deaths at Ephrata. Are there records of baptisms or marriages? No baptisms. Uh, and this was an Anabaptist community. And so among all Anabaptist community, things like uh, uh, Mennonites and Amish and Church of the Brethren, sometimes baptism records are hard to find. Now, baptism for Beisel was necessary for admission to the congregation. So we can point to a couple different times when he's holding baptisms. And we, we occasionally know a name or two, but this is not infant baptism. This is adult baptism, folks waiting to acknowledge their, uh, their birth, or their, their baptism. And there was a second part that was it marriage records? Marriages, yes. Yeah. Marriages. Um, the Sensiman, Jacob Sensiman and Margaret Klopp, are uh, really the only two that are acknowledged in the records because Beisel actually performed that marriage. And in fact, the records don't name them specifically, but using other bits of information, we're able to whittle it down. It had to be that couple. Um, the, the other churches, like their daughter, uh, Rachel, who married at the German Reformed Church, we can pick those things up in the more established church records. But for that first generation, there wasn't much need for marriage because they already came as married families. And going back to the, the issue of the Brethren Church, I seem to recall reading an article about Beisel on a Brethren website where he is called a martinet. Yeah, um, there was an, an author in the 1940s who wrote a book called the uh, Conrad Beisel, Mystic and Martinet. Uh, Beisel is a, is a very complex character. And uh, even in his own day, he had strong supporters and very strong critics. Um, an example of a married member who falls on both sides of that is uh, Johannes Hildebrand. Hildebrand was a married member and his daughter was a married member. She had married, actually, a son of Alexander Mack, founder of the Church of the Brethren, Valentine Mack. And Valentine and, and Christina uh, Mack uh, just lived about a block from the cloister. And Christina's father, uh, uh, Hildebrand, uh, Jacob Hildebrand, um, at one point, there was a suggestion that Beisel should receive a title since he was the sort of founder and leader. And brothers said, let's call him father. Well, Hildebrand raised a great uproar because he said, I can't call an earthly man father. That title is reserved for God alone. And it really it caused quite a turmoil in the congregation for several weeks until it was finally settled with the agreement that you could call Beisel father or you could call him brother. It was left to you. Now, while Hildebrand seemed to be the one to stir up that controversy about honoring Beisel, he also seems to be the, the author of one of the best pieces of material we have to understand effort as theology. So again, I think you see people constantly learning and reevaluating and reestablishing their own connections to the community. Okay. Did the church members tend to come from a specific region of Germany? Any non-Germans? 
Uh, like most Pennsylvania German immigrants in, in the early 18th century, they tended to be from the area we would call the Palatinate or the Faults. So that lower Rhine River Valley and Switzerland, they're Swiss, there's Alsatians. So we say Pennsylvania Germans, it's really German speaking settlers who settled in Pennsylvania. And that seems to be what we know of people, people's background. That seems to be their origin. But I must say, we know almost nothing about the majority of the members of this community prior to their arrival at Ephrata. There are some exceptions to that statement, but the great number, we know very little about their background before they arrive here. And even once they arrive, we don't always know an awful lot about them particularly. Uh, there was a second part to that. Um, I think non-Germans. Non-German. Oh, yes. Oh, absolutely. Um, so for a short time, Beisel had a small following in Chester County, and um, that did not seem to last very long. And I suspect the language may have been a barrier to that. There's very, very sketchy records about that small English group. Okay. Um, I see a number of Keller descendants uh, listed in the chat box here. Sure. Can you say a bit about the Keller hymnal in the collection? Right. There's a, a book in our collection, and there's a bit of a mystery about this book, at least from my perspective. It was a hymnal, one of those beautifully illustrated music manuscripts created for the community, uh, for members of the community. And it was, according to the one title page, it was a copy that belonged to Conrad Beisel. Beisel died in July of 1768. And by the end of the year, that book was given to Jacob Keller. And his name was put in with a kind of a second dedication title page in that beautiful manuscript writing. But why did Keller receive the book? That to me is the mystery. Um, we know also that Keller is an early follower of Beisel, seems to be a very devoted follower of Beisel. And if you visit the cemetery, you'll find uh, the Keller's gravestones really just about a yard or two uh, next to uh, Beisel's, right at the foot of Beisel's grave. So the Kellers must have played a large role in the community, but their name comes up very infrequently in the original materials. And why he received that beautiful book, I just don't understand. But I will also say, Miller gave away lots of things. Peter Miller, who becomes the leader, gave away things that belonged to Beisel. I think it was his effort to keep the story of Ephrata preserved if, in fact, the community itself did not survive. The greatest example of that is the Ephrata Codex, a book that was given to Benjamin Franklin. It's now in the Library of Congress. And if you want to see an Ephrata music manuscript at its most glorious state, please go to the Library of Congress website, loc.gov, type in Ephrata Codex. You're going to see a couple of black and white photos that were done in the 1940s. Scroll down below those and look for what looks like a green book cover and click on that. 900 and some pages of beautifully illustrated music manuscript. And also for the Kellers on, on the um, program here with us, uh, Lydia has just posted the family page on our website Great. for the Kellers, and she's also posted the Codex uh, link as well. In the Great. Show. Thank you, Lydia. <laughs> Lydia is our social media expert and, and computer technology whiz that, that helps us out. Uh, what we do without her, I don't know. Um, got time for a couple more. So were members pacifists? Yes. Yes. Um, I mean, I mentioned Jacob Gorgas, who showed up with his note that he was not fit for military service. Um, there are other notes like that, but we can't, at this point, I can't find them all uh, excusing them from service. But they seem not to have actively participated in, in, the, in any conflicts. During the Revolutionary War, Ephrata did serve as a military hospital that same winter of Valley Forge. And it was not because that they had any great skills, uh, but they had big, big buildings to use as hospitals. Uh, they were in a very rich farmland of supplies. The army came with their own doctors and the 
two dozen or so celibates there and the married folks in the neighborhood served as nurses, orderlies, that sort of thing. But they didn't actively seek participation. Okay. And with that, we have a nice segue here to our closing. Catherine Callahan's asking if it's possible to post this online. And in fact, this recording will be posted on our YouTube channel at Historic Effort at Cloister uh, early next week sometime. So you can uh, look for it there. And, and Lydia's got the, <laughs> she's on the ball. <laughs> she's got the uh, link for the YouTube uh, channel up there. We thank everybody for attending today. Um, we will be following up by sending out a short survey. Please help us improve our future virtual presentations by completing this survey. We're all learning as we go here. I do want to make a plug. August 13th, Michael will be back with us presenting a program on the uh, Ephrata's role during the Revolutionary War. It's time as a hospital after the Philadelphia campaign. Information uh, to register for that can be found on our website and on our Facebook page as well. And again, Lydia's posted the link up there. So thank you again, everybody, for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, Michael.